Hello, everybody. Welcome to Pixel Tunes Radio, episode 14. I'm Mike. And I'm Ed. And you are listening to our Contra episode. That's right. We are doing a series spotlight on Contra the series. Yeah, we're going to go chronologically. We're going to start off with the origins of the game and kind of lead you guys through all the music and the games up until present day with the latest Contra releases. And, you know, just like we've always done in the past, I pick five tracks, Ed picks the other five, and... That's kind of how we do it here. Yeah, Contra's had a lot of excellent music. Fantastic stuff. So we got a lot of good stuff for you today. Absolutely. So Mike, what's been going on with you since our last podcast? Ah, oh, man, I'm trying to think. Well, just been working on the next episode of Dude, You Haven't Played This Game. Uh, I finished my basement, which was really cool. So the basement is totally done. My game room is intact. Looks great. Complete. And you guys are going to get a chance to see it on the next episode, so really excited to show that off because it came out really cool. What about you, Ed? What have you been up to? I just came back from vacation. Yeah. So I'm well tanned. Yeah, I went up to Lake George in, in uh, upstate New York, and it was fun. I remember when I went there originally, I was, I think, 10 or 11 years old. There was an arcade there right on a little touristy strip they have. It was the first place I ever saw Street Fighter II in the arcade, and I really fell in love with it. And I just, I remember that place, so... Coming back there like 15 years later was was kind of cool. Unfortunately, all the arcades are now just ticket machines. It sucks. You know? It's awful. It's There's racing games, there's some light gun shooting games, and then there's these freaking ticket machines. So, I mean, my kids loved it because they got to get prizes at the end of everything. Yeah. Although one machine I saw there, Aliens Armageddon, is really, really good. It's a light gun game? Yeah. Okay. But you use, like, full-size rifles. Oh, that's cool. The bottom of the rifle, you know, where the magazine clip goes, is a button, so you kind of have to slam the bottom of the gun, like uh, slamming I, a cartridge into place to reload. That is really and cool. And then it's got a button I, up I need front. to play this. Yeah, it's yeah. got a button up front for grenades and firebombs. It's really action-packed. You don't need to, like, shoot specific things on the screen to get new weapons, like in Virtua Cop or, or House of the Dead. Guys will just, like, toss you weapons, and then your weapon will change in-game, so you go from, like, a shotgun to an automatic rifle. It's really, really cool. And the, the, the screen is, like, an LED 1080p, like, really, really nice-looking stuff, so pretty so intense. So what you're telling me is this is pretty much Contra the game. Because really, I More mean, for arcade, it's like an updated version of Contra. Yeah, except you're fighting Xenomorphs instead of giant... Well, yeah, that's kind of the thing about it, um, about the Contra series, is it's kind of an evolution of, or they steal a lot from the Aliens movies. Yeah, I mean, that's As far right. as the Xenomorphs, yeah. And Predator. Yep. You're going through yeah. the jungle and, and fighting yep. aliens and stuff. So I guess we'll start off with the first game, the very first Contra. Uh, now this game came out in the arcades as well as the Nintendo Entertainment System. Yep, originally it was an arcade game. Right. And I would probably say that the original game for the Nintendo is probably the most well-known, at least as far as, you know, on a global scale. Like most people kind of dropped off after the third game. And only like the hardcore people stayed and you know try, tried to check out the game and play it and everything. But I would say most people know about this series from the first game. Yeah, absolutely. Even though it was originally released in the arcade, it came out on the NES. Nintendo did the arcade version of uh, the PlayChoice 10, so you could That's find right. it in the arcades there. It was on the MSX2, the Spectrum, the Amstrad, Commodore 64. There was even a DOS version of it. So whether you were in the UK, Japan, or the US, you you knew about this game. Yeah. Whether it was named Contra, Probotector, or Grizor. The first one was called Grizor in Europe and Japan. Yeah. Right. Although and the NES version was called Probotector in, right. in Europe. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess that whole thing, I guess, because of the, the word Contra meant something different in Europe. It was like something that happened in... In the history books, actually, yeah, yeah. in real life, <laughs> kind of pre prevented that name from occurring because it was so, um, it had just happened at that point in time, like in the 80s or something like that, or the 70s. So it was still very much, I guess, a taboo word. Whereas for us, we thought, you know, I don't even know. I mean, what, what do you think of when you think of the word Contra? I just think of two dudes running two. through the jungle, shooting spread guns at aliens. <laughs> but also in Europe, they replaced all the biological characters, I guess, the humans the and humans. the aliens. Everybody turned into robots because European violence laws were a little more strict at that point, so they needed to do that in order to get a, a release out there. Yeah, they did the same thing with uh, the Ninja Turtles. Uh, they were called they were the Hero Turtles. Hero Turtles. Turtles. Yeah. Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Because I think Ninjutsu was outlawed there, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Anyways, the interesting thing about the, ar the original arcade version was that it was vertically oriented. Even though it was a side-scroller, which is weird, you know, you'd have a limited amount of space to move horizontally, but because the levels were tall, you'd be able to go up and down through the, through the levels without having to see the screen scroll, which helped better like on the waterfall levels where you were actually jumping upwards instead of moving from side to side. Yeah. Contra 4 kind of took that as well because of the double screens yeah. of Contra 4, which we'll get into later. So the first Contra soundtrack was actually created by Hidenori Maizawa and Kiyohiro Sada. And so they've done basically a bunch of work with Konami. Maizawa-san started with Konami and he actually was really good with converting arcade versions of game soundtracks over to the NES sound chip. So he was kind of put in charge of that, so that was his kind of bread and butter right there. With uh, Sada-san, he started with Konami and then he also got a job working for Natsume. Yep. So he was going back and forth with them and eventually he went full-time with Natsume and then left Natsume in 1993. Um, but it, he's done a bunch of series, he's uh, used a bunch of different aliases as well, so it's a little harder to track his stuff. But um, his favorite work, according to uh, the video game music website uh, that we have here, is Scat for the NES. Yeah, which that was is, a great game. Which is kind of a Contra-ish It's very game. similar, the music sounds very similar, yeah. too. Both of these guys also worked on The Adventures of Bayou Billy, which is an amazing soundtrack. Bayou Billy! <laughs> <laughs> They've got credits like Blades of Steel, Russian Attack, uh, Ninja Turtles, you know, so when, when you think of that kind of trademark Konami NES sound, mm -hmm. that you could just kind of hear one of those soundtracks and say, oh, this is obviously a Konami game. These guys were very responsible for establishing that, That's really that cool. kind of sound that Konami had. So the first track we're playing from the original Contra for the NES is the Energy Zone stage. I really like this song. It's it's really like, there's parts of it where you have these melodies that kind of, not really overlap each other, but it's kind of like, it'll go like an octave higher, like just slightly, right after the note finishes playing. So it'll be like, da na 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 It's really cool. And then you get this kind of staccato, dun 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 Yeah. It's very cinematic sounding and very powerful. It makes you feel like you're running through the jungle. It does. Oh, there's a monster. There's an alien. You know. I like it. Yeah. I like it. You like my rendition? I like your rendition. I always thought because Living Color was popular at the time and they had that Homie the Clown. Yeah. I always thought, Homie, don't play that. Homie, don't play that. Now you can't unhear it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for ruining this song for me. All right, so this is Contra, the NES version, Energy Zone theme. Let's do it up.
back. That was Super Contra from the arcade. I never played this version. <sighs> so good. Is it good? Yeah. Technology-wise, it feels like halfway between an NES and a Super Nintendo in terms of, like, processing power and graphics and stuff. Yeah, a lot of arcade games are like that. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and again, it's got that kind of traditional Konami arcade music oh, yeah. with the orchestra hits and, mm -hmm. the, and the, the, the constant hi-hats and stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah, there was a version of this track on the NES version of Super C, mm -hmm. but I don't think it was as good as the arcade oh, version. Oh no, this version blows it out of the water. I mean, don't get me wrong, the NES version is great, but I definitely prefer this, this version. This was a song called Thunder Landing and it was composed by Kazuki Murawaka and Motowaki Furukawa. And they, they have a pretty storied history as far as what they've done. Uh, Murawaka-san has worked on Top Gun, Metal Gear, and pretty much worked on all the, or most of the Metal Gear games. And then Furukawa-san uh, worked on a, a lot more Konami stuff than the other guy, at least a more varied worked on uh, the N64 Castlevania game, the first one, uh, which was called Akumajo Dracula Apocalypse back in the day. Uh, Circle the Moon, so, you know, obviously, he's a Castlevania guy, so I'm okay with him. <laughs> worked on Gradius and the Gradius Rebirth game later on, Gunstar Heroes, so he, he's done a lot of stuff, Police Knots, uh, Twinbee. Absolutely. A lot of Konami games with these yes. two guys. It's really interesting to me that even though the earlier Contra games all had different composers, the sound was very uniform from game to game. They all had a very similar vibe and a very similar feel. And they even repeated the themes, you know, from the original games from time to time. So. Yeah, yeah. Most of the games that came out, especially later on, always, at least up until, I'd say, the PS1, PS2 era, which we don't even talk about the PS1 games. I mean, come on. Yeah, we'll go over those later. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the later games didn't really reference the old soundtracks as much. Right. Except for the games that kind of like were nostalgic revisits. Until retro started becoming popular again. Yes. And when the developers started understanding that people were reliving these, and like when OC Remix came out, mm -hmm. people started doing remixes. Like, you know, Jay Kaufman ended up yep. doing a, a Contra soundtrack eventually. That's when designers started saying, oh, people love these old tunes, let's remix them, let's right. you know, reinvigorate them and put them back in our games. So when was the first time that you played Contra? Uh, I don't remember exactly what year it was. I mean, I was pretty young, but... No, you need to know the exact year. I need, the exact, <laughs> I need dates, I need times, I need hours. It had probably been out for maybe a year or two. And, uh, you know, we, I don't think I ever owned it, but I borrowed it from a friend, like on the long term. Okay. And then my brother and I were on the just, long term. On the long term. Is I, that I, like you you borrowed it? Listen, I had it for long <laughs> enough that I could put in the thirty lives code <laughs> and beat the game with thirty one lives left. That's so I awesome. got pretty damn good at the game. Yeah. I remember whenever my mom was like, "Dinner will be ready in twenty minutes." I knew it took me exactly twenty minutes to get through the game. I would sit down and play Contra, and by like the time I was beating the final boss, my mom would be like, "Dinner's ready." So That's I would just awesome. Go upstairs. And my brother and I would, would play it together, too. We were both very good at it. So we'd just tag-team the game and rip through it very easily. Uh, I would probably say the first time I ever played Contra was actually not the original. It was Super C. Hmm. I hadn't actually played the original Contra until probably about high school. So probably like in the like later half of the 90s. Yeah. And so I played Super C with a friend of mine back in the day. I mean, I had it was, you know, the play dates, I guess you could call them. So it was about, I'd say third grade, and uh, this guy, who I'm actually still somewhat friends with, this guy Jay, came over with Super C, and he, he knew I had a Nintendo, and he had games, so it was one of those things like, I'll bring games over. <laughs> so he, he brought Super C over, and I did so bad in it, man. I was so terrible. It wasn't until later on I would get Contra 3, and I would say I didn't really start reappreciating the series until Shattered Soldier, which I'll get into my Shattered Soldier love later on because I freaking love that game. Anyways, yeah, that was my experience with Contra. You know, I think I rented the other Contra games like Super C and Contra Force afterwards, but never really got into them that much. Like like I said, you know, when you rent them, you only spend about three three to four days with the game itself. Yeah. So I played them and I, I liked them, but I, don't, I never owned them. I never really got that far into the games themselves. Yeah. So Contra is really like, the original NES Contra is really, until the Super Nintendo... Contra 3 came out, that was my Contra, man. That was, that was my Contra! I would say Contra 3 was probably the game that I spent the most time with, like, pre-PS2 era. Yeah. 
So I, I spent a lot of time learning that game and figuring figuring that game out. And uh, I really I really enjoyed Contra 3. I mean, it was a really solid experience. Yeah. Um, so chronologically speaking, after Super Contra was released for the arcade and the NES, Operation C came out for the Game Boy, which was basically like the original... NES game on the, on the Game Boy. Is it different though? Like I haven't actually played Operation C. There are minor differences. I mean, you've got to account obviously for the fact that there's no color and there's right. smaller memory. Uh, the music was obviously redone a little bit in stereo, slightly remixed here and there, but yeah. overall it wasn't too too different from the original game itself. After Operation C, the game series kind of took a little bit of a break, really short, and ended up coming out with Contra 3, The Alien Wars, which is the game we were just talking about. God, what an awesome game. I <sighs> love this game. So Contra 3 kind of brought the game series forward, and I've actually done uh, some investigation as far as um, uh, interviews with... Uh, the lead, you know, like programmers and the people who were behind the series. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to make a game uh, where you weren't fighting like just little tiny grunt bosses, like grunt enemies. You were fighting like mini bosses all throughout each level. Hmm. So there's that level where you're just like basically running through a gauntlet of, of much smaller major enemies um, where you're just kind of climbing the chain until you get to the big big baddie and that's when you beat the level you feel like you've accomplished something because you went from bad guy to bad guy and each each enemy is like a major threat it's not like you know a blow over grunt where you're just like two bullets you're yeah. dead you and that, that game ideology really kind of permeated after that game came out I mean Treasure took that concept and ran with it because yeah. their games are like mini boss after mini boss after mini boss yeah um, and then that, that also got into, you know, shmups where you have lots of mini-bosses throughout stages because the formula worked so well. It's a lot better than running through grunt after grunt after grunt. You know, there's there's a lot of variation in the patterns and stuff. And you could do more with the mini-bosses. It also gave the games a much more richer and more vibrant feel and a heavier feel, too. Like, you actually fought, felt like you were fighting for something. Mm -hmm. You didn't feel like... You were just kind of going through the motions of, you know, like in a Mega Man game, for example, where it's just like, bad guy, bad guy, bad guy, bad guy, boss. Yeah. It was huge freaking dudes that I got to destroy with my guns, so. And I'm assuming it was more fun for the developers, too, because they were able to be a little more creative instead of just designing grunts. You know, they could, they could get a lot of bosses, especially, like, with treasure games. I mean, those, some of those enemy designs... Have got to be fun to, to, to come up with. You Absolutely, know, yeah. Freaking crazy dudes. Yeah. So, Contra 3 The Alien Wars for the Super Nintendo was composed by Akihata, Masanori Adachi, Miki Higashino, and Tappy Iwase. Tappy. Tappy. They've got lots of games that they've done. Yes, they have. <laughs> they've done a ton of work for Konami. So, Tappy Iwase. Uh, Iwase son has done work for Smash Brothers Ball, Brawl. Uh, Metal Gear games, uh, Metal Gear Acid series, uh, Metal Gear Solid 2, a lot of Metal Gear stuff. Well, he created the, the original Metal Gear theme mm -hmm. that played through the first three Metal Gear games. Right. And then there was some issues where the original Metal Gear theme, people said it sounded a little bit too much like a song by a Russian composer. Yeah. So Tappy said that it was just a coincidence, but other people didn't say it was going so there's a little controversy behind that so that's why they omitted that theme from metal gear solid 4 right. and onward yeah. so unfortunately his name got a little marred in that that's that kind of a that's lame yeah so but he's done you know up until metal gear solid 4 he did a whole bunch of different metal gear solids almost almost every one of the major releases and for some of the other composers, Mickey Higashino. Uh, Higashino worked on uh, the Suikoden series. Uh, that's actually what she's uh, best known for. And she worked on Yi Air Kung Fu, Life Force, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, Contra 3, of course, the tournament fighters for the Genesis. Worked with uh, Tappy Iwase, actually, on a bunch of other stuff, not just Contra, Morio Senki Madara 2 and some other games. So, you know, they've all kind of worked together with each other. Masanori Adashi worked on Axele, which Axele is a really fantastic Great shooter. Great game. Great music, Ru too. Russian Attack, Super Castlevania 4, which... Oh, <laughs> love it! 
and of course Smash Brothers Brawl. Who hasn't? Man, I want a list of composers that haven't worked on Brawl. No, because I think the list is going to be shorter than the ones who have. Worked Even on like Brawl. Nobuo Matsu worked on. Yeah, of course. Brawl. Yeah, of course, man. Yeah. And so the last person, Akihara, we've talked about her before. She's done work on a bunch of different games, but, you know, who hasn't? (laughs) Konami. Yes. She's done Konami stuff. Stuff. So anyways, let's talk about the composers. Let's get right to the music. Boss Battle. This is the track from Contra 3 The Alien Wars. Go ahead and boss battle it up. Boss, your battle. Battle your boss. Welcome back to Pixel Tunes Radio. That amazing little piece was Contra Force for the NES. You know, everybody talks about this game like it's kind of the black sheep of the series. Well, it wasn't originally a Contra game. Right, it was Arkhound, right? Yes. Yeah, it was Arkhound originally, and then they ended up just transforming it and changing it into a Contra game and putting it out. And it actually only saw an American release. Yeah. They followed that up with Contra Adventure, too, that was never released in Japan. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know <laughs> the, the Dark Ages of Contra. I, I don't know the, the Dark Ages of Contra, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that in a bit. 
But no, Contra Force was a was a decent game. It yeah. wasn't just like, different. It wasn't fully finished, I don't think, because there was a lot of slowdown and flicker in the game. Mm -hmm. But it was cool that you could select different characters with different abilities, which they kind of started bringing forth in later Contra games after that. But the music was was really cool. Yeah, the music is really good. I like this this last track that we just played, Stage Four. And so for the composers, we have Kenichi Matsubara, who is pretty much the... I know him from Castlevania 2. I think everybody, but everybody else knows him from Castlevania 2. Mm -hmm. Yasuhiko Mano and Tomoya Tomita. Right, and Tomita worked on Ninja Turtles 3, the Manhattan Project yeah. for the NES. So if you're noticing some similarities between that track and just about every song from the <laughs> Manhattan Project... That's because they probably share the same composer. And Yasuhiko Mano, uh, Mano-san, worked on uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the NES arcade port. Absolutely. So, very Turtles-esque type music. Not really Contra-ish, but still really good stuff. Really so what, what were some of your favorite Contra moments? Oh man, I would say there's, there's two that really stand out in my mind. The first was from Contra 3, when you are... You're going through this gauntlet of mini bosses. Um, one of which was when you're on the wall, crawling up the wall, and there's this. Oh man, I don't even remember. It was like an, it was like a robot, I think, and he was shooting at you, and you had to move up and down and like shoot at him. Yeah, that narrows it down. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> the people who play Contra Three are totally gonna get what I'm saying, but that that one I'm not. Was it really, the big one that came through the the background? That's, that's the one like I was gonna say. clawed his way through the. So, when you're on your way to that one that you're talking about, mm -hmm. you fight this one guy, and I'm like, all right, whatever. So you get past him, and then you get past all the other stuff, and you get to this point where you go into this empty room, and you're just like, what's going to happen? And this huge robot just, like, rips the the whole the, the sheet metal of the yeah. of the stage in the background. You're just like, oh, my God. You're like, that's <laughs> so cool. So that was a moment that really stood out in my brain, and, like, that boss, I, I had such difficulty beating, and when I finally beat him, it was like one of those like yes moments. Yeah, that's great. So it makes you stand up. And the other uh, moment, I would I would probably say, Shattered Soldier. There were just so many gross enemies, which we'll talk about that in a bit. But Shattered Soldier, I would probably say the very first stage boss. Like it, it's funny because the Contra series kind of became so over the top that it was almost like parroting the. Parody, oh, parody yeah, I got completely extreme. The, the original games, which the original games were extreme, you know, as they were. But with Shattered Soldier, you see this boss, and you're like, all right, that's just going to be the normal, like, stage one boss. And then they're like, just kidding. And, like, you see this, like, baby, this mutated, like, fetus <laughs> baby thing with, like, blood everywhere and, like, spitting out, like, all this nasty like stuff, like these little bees and stuff. Oh, just so weird, so gross and weird. I love it's, it. It seems like that that traditionally became the way where early stages in Contra games were more like technological, where you'd go into like a base made of metal and steel, mm. and then as you went through, as you got closer to the final boss, it would start getting like more gross and alien, yeah. and organic and. By the end of some of these games, the bosses are just like, who the heck even dreamed this stuff yeah. up? And what were they smoking? <laughs> and what's interesting is uh, they kind of started mixing that stuff in in the earlier stages in the later games. Yeah. So you'd play like Shattered Soldier or Neo Contra, and you see these enemies getting more and more alien-ish earlier in the game. What about you? What were some of the memories that you had? I, I think my Contra, my favorite Contra moments were more like experience-based. Okay. Like I... I just I absolutely love the first Contra game. I think, even though I'm a big fan of all the other ones, I think that still remains my favorite one just because I love the, the co-op that my brother and I used to do just constantly. There's just a great childhood memory of us working in unison to get through the levels That's and cool. just getting so efficient at it that we could just blow through it, you know, like I said before, yeah. and not even have to think twice about it. But I think, you know, same as you. I really love that, that, that boss that you were talking about in Contra 3 with the alien that rips through. And then I, I loved all of Hardcores. Mm -hmm. Hardcores. Corpse. Hardcores. Corpse. And, you know, later on after seeing the treasure games that came after it and knowing that hard, Hardcores was made up of, you know, treasure team members. Yeah. 
just seeing a lot of that stuff that later ended up in like Gunstar Heroes and Radiant Silver Gun and all that. That whole game for me, all the way through, was just mind blowing. And it's very, very, very hard to get to the end of that game, but I eventually mm -hmm. ended up doing it. With um, hardcores? With hardcores, <laughs> yes. So, speaking of the end of hardcores. Yes. Our next track is going to be from Contra Hardcores, and it will be the ending theme. So, you know, I'll be hearing this for the first time since I've never actually beaten Hardcorps. <laughs> I really like the dynamic of the game, though, where you can pick between multiple different characters. It gives you a chance to try out different feelings for the characters yeah. as far as like how they play. And honestly, they all do play differently. I mean, the robot's like the super crazy fast. And the werewolf is more like... It's more rapid fire. Yeah, more rapid fire-ish. And then the two humans are basically the same thing. I'd say the girl is a little faster than the guy, but... Um, yeah, and that was... That Sheena looks... and... It wasn't Bill. Because Bill Riser, this was... This took place, this was a prequel? This was... Well, this, this dealt with Colonel Bahamut. Right. Which later ended up coming back in um, Hardcore Uprising. Right. That was supposed to be like a rebirth for the series. So this actually happens five years after Contra 3, The Alien Wars. Oh, okay. So Bill Reiser then at that point is probably... I mean, if we're going like chronologically, timeline-wise, he was either alive and kicking or he was cryogenically frozen or whatever. Yeah. Like, well, it's, it's Ray and Sheena that are the human characters. That's right, Ray. Yeah, Ray and Sheena. Sheena's the girl, Ray. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 liked, I liked that game. It, it, it was fun. It was just so difficult. I couldn't get past, like, I think, stage three. Yeah, you really had to, like, yeah. own the game and, and, and work for weeks and weeks and weeks on it in order to finally get through it. See, I didn't even, like, play it until, like, the early 2000s mm. because I, I I was at a point where I was in high school and I was playing games that were coming out as they were coming out, and then I didn't start playing the older stuff and still, until, like, the early 2000s because at that point I had a laptop and I had a controller, yeah. and I would just download and emulate these games because I never owned uh, a Genesis. So I would emulate all this Genesis stuff to try it out and, and see what I was missing out on as a Nintendo guy. And it was a really good game. It yeah, was, even today, it, it still holds up. Definitely. You know, it pushes that Genesis to its limits. Definitely. And a lot of the current, like, indie retro throwback action games do throw a lot of stuff that Hardcores had yeah. into it. Hard uh, it was also very innovative for its time as far as the split storylines. You didn't really see a lot of that in like in running gun games. Right. But Contra kind of injected this whole, you know, if you play as this character, you can go different branching paths. Kind of like what Castlevania was doing with um, with the Dracula X and, you know, all those types of games. Yep. And Castlevania 3. So... So this was composed by our favorites, Akira Yamaoka, Hiroshi Kobayashi, and Mishiro Yamane. We've pretty much discussed them, uh, I <laughs> yeah, think, in my, my, Ed's, my Ed's Picks episode where we did another track. We did Jurassic Dope from, from Contra Hardcores. So this is called Hardcores Blues. It is the ending theme. It's a really cool bluesy track with some great percussion. And not a lot of people have heard it because not a lot of people could beat this free game. <laughs> Me included. Me included. So you can sit there and listen to this song and pat yourself on the back for pretending that you've gotten through. You did it, guys. Hardcore. You, you Congra did it. Congratulations. Congratulations. You're a winner. winner.
this fall to the BW, a show that separates the boundaries of reality from the creation of all that makes sense. Days of our 30 Lives Code, a Contra experience. Meet Bill Riser. Ladies, this dreamboat has run on helicopter blades with the greatest of ease, all the while blowing up only the ugliest of alien soldiers. Hey ladies, Bill here. I'm not a begging man, but I can tell you're out of options. Make sure to pick up the latest Contra Digest for a special code just for you. And his one-time partner, now traitorous villain, the always angry, always steamy Lance Bean. A man who would stop at nothing to win your hearts so he can feed it to the alien queen. Mysterious as he is good looking, this charmer will woo your soul with a spread shot from hell. Don't ask me about my past. It's not important. What is important here is that you join my terrorist group, the Blood Falcons. Don't make me ask twice, sugar. And finally, the woman they both yearn for, Lucia, a female bioroid super soldier who saved Bill, but deep down wants to be as evil as Lance. Armed to the teeth and still looking sexy, she's ready for combat against her heart. Oh, Billy, come back to me, will you? I'm tired of fighting deformed, bleeding baby fetuses that peek up bugs and giant grindy machine thieves. There's no time for that, Lucia. We need to ride flying missiles to our destination as they spin uncontrollably while we attempt to destroy deadly robot whales without losing our lunch. <laughs> you fool! Lance, what are you doing here? Why, Bill, I do believe you should ask your sexy partner, Lucia, the same question. I'm sorry it had to end this way, Billy, but deep down I want to be bad and Lance is going to be with me forever. Stop, Lucia, you don't know what you're doing. Think of all the brutally ugly monsters and aliens we've killed. I already have. <laughs> Eat dirt, Riser! Will Bill survive his recently betraying lover and fellow alien stomper Lucia and take out Lance? Who will Lucia end up with? Find out on Days of Our 30 Lives Code, a Contra experience. Coming soon to daytime television on the BW, right after As the Katamari Turns. Check local listings for safe states. Welcome back. That was Contra, Shattered Soldier. God, what a song. Oh, love it. Absolutely <laughs> freaking adore this soundtrack. This is one of the first soundtracks I ever actually sought out and bought. Yeah. But I'll talk more about my experience. Let's kind of go back to the whole chronological order of Contra. Right. So we're, like I said, we're going through chronologically from the inception of the whole Contra series up until current day. So even though that was from Contra Shattered Soldier, between Contra Hardcores and Shattered Soldier, they released two games, I guess you could call them. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> sort of. So there was Contra Legacy of War and Contra Adventure. Or is it C, the Contra Adventure? No, it's just Contra oh, Adventure. Okay. There was a C around it, but it yeah. was never part of the actual title. Right. Not that anybody cares. No. <laughs> so both of these games were produced by Appaloosa Interactive, which was an American game development company. I don't know why they gave Contra to the Americans. I have a theory. I do have a theory. You've heard um, upon me your theory, sir. Yes. I, I'm thinking that the Contra games probably sold a lot better in America and were probably better known in America than in Japan. I don't think that Japan didn't like Contra. I think they did. And in fact, I've, I've read interviews with the producer of all the really good Contra games, let's just say. And, and he has actually said that, you know, these games in Japan, like, the interviewer asks, well, what, what is Contra, like, how is Contra portrayed or viewed uh, in terms of popularity as it is in America? And he was like, yeah, it's about the same, you know, as it is in America. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily think that Japan hated Contra. It's not like with with Japan's hatred of Metroid. So I think they're fans of it, but at the same time, I, I think the American audience, uh, it, the games were built for, because they relied on a very heavy influence from a military-based like sci-fi movies and stuff like that, and, and action movies like you know Arnold Schwarzenegger type flicks. Right, which were American movies. Right. And so I think they took a lot of inspiration from that stuff, so... Bearing that in mind, I think the series was more popular, was more well-known in America. 
So I'm thinking that what happened was with Legacy of War and Contra the Contra Adventure, they were like, all right, we're going to outsource this. It'll be cheaper than doing it in-house, which that always boggles my mind. Like, let's give somebody else a try at this. And they did, and it failed. It, it just it didn't work out, and that's when they kind of pulled the license back. Konami has done this in the past. They're doing it even to this day. True, they did it with Silent Hill. Yep, and they did it with Castlevania. So, and now that Lords of Shadow is done, we'll have to see what happens. But with Contra, these two games came out. They were they were bombed both critically, financially. I mean, they, they were just such a disaster for Konami. And the soundtracks aren't even noted. Yeah, no, it, it's a shame. Because we would have loved to, if the soundtracks, even if the games weren't good, if the soundtracks were good, we would be like, all right, let's do it. But yeah. there's just no not notable tracks. or. There are a few tracks here and there, but they yeah. sound so like MIDI right. and very like cinematic. They, they just don't fit in with the Contra soundtrack yeah. on a whole yeah. from inception to current day. Supposedly Legacy of War is better than the Contra Adventure. A little bit. There's a little extra guitar and it's a little heavier, but mm. it still doesn't really strike me in any yeah. important way. So now that we're done talking about that garbage, let's talk about <laughs> Shattered Soldier. So the license came back to Konami. They pulled the ability for other developers like this Appaloosa to create games. Uh, with the Contra name on them. So Shattered Soldier came back to Konami. Uh, they wanted to create a game that was throwback, but was also like an advancement that they could do things that they could never do on any other system prior. Smart move, Japan. Exactly. And so they, they came out with Contra Shattered Soldier. It, it, it's such a brutally hard game. And they added in this like percentage counter so you could see, based on the amount of enemies that you kill, how high of a percentage you can get. And like trying to do that with without the 30 lives code, forget it, man. Yeah. This is such, it, I think it's one of the hardest games, if not the hardest game in the series, other than Car Hard Corpse and, geez, I would say, maybe Contra 4 with the challenge of challenge modes. Those yeah. are pretty brutal. I mean, I gotta agree with you there because just the addition of that, that enemy percentage mm -hmm. meter, that already shows that they're catering to the perfectionists. Yep. And watching speedruns of this game on YouTube, it's crazy. I mean, you literally have to memorize every single inch of this level, or you're never, or never going to survive it. Never mind do a speedrun of it. The thing about the speedruns, though, is is, and this is what makes Contra Contra is, you don't know what's coming up unless you've memorized the full game. So it's really a, it's the sort of game where you have to play it over and over yep. and over and over again and memorize where each enemy is going to come out, how you can kill them. And aim aiming for it before they even get on the screen. Exactly. And that, it, it really did bring a really hardcore element. And they rewarded you Hard pretty... Hardcore. Hardcore <laughs> element. Um, they really did reward you very well for doing an excellent job in the game. Like, everything was based on, like, rankings, like A, B, C, S, or whatever. And if you got S ranking... In, and you beat the game with S ranking. I think you can unlock a secret video. I never could do it, but it's they took Bill Riser, who is the main one of the main characters in the game, and uh, you end up fighting um, Rocket Knight Sparkster oh. from the Sparkster game. It's a really cool little like nod to other Konami games and be like, oh, you remember Sparkster? So that's like the last thing that Sparkster appeared in other than that new Rocket Knight game that came out that was not that well received. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. You should look at everybody who's listening, check it out. Um, there's a video of it online somewhere. It's it's kind of a really neat throwback. Yeah, we'll have to put that on our Facebook page. Yeah, definitely. So so Shattered Soldier was composed by our two favorites, Sota Fujimori <laughs> and Akira Yamaoka. Uh, this particular track that we just played was Akira Yamaoka. Right. You can kind of tell who composed what because... Yamaoka's tracks, and I think we discussed this last time we played from Shattered we Soldier. Did. The more metal, this is like almost techno metal tracks were the Akira Yamaoka tracks. And the ones that are normally straight up techno dance tracks were primarily composed by Soda Fujimori. Yeah. So the next game we're going to play from is Neo Contra, which was written solely by Fujimori san, and it's entirely techno Absolutely. and entirely awesome. It's really good stuff. Um, to add to the thing about uh, Akira Yamaoka and the, this Hell Drive track that we listened to, that was the Shattered Soldier track called Hell Drive. I don't know about anybody else, but uh, to our viewers, or listeners, or uh, I guess both, uh, do, do you guys feel like there's a very, like, for Metalhead specifically, Machine Head 
th this track sounds unbelievably like Machine Head uh, at points, uh, especially when they're pulling the strings on the guitar to make that sound effect. Really neat stuff. So yeah. I, I feel like there was a lot of influence from uh, heavy metal bands at that time that were out for the soundtrack. It reminds me a lot of Static X. Too. Yeah, yeah, Static X, yeah, that's also true. So, um, and then with this Neo Contra track, it's kind of like the complete opposite. I mean, you've got these dance tracks, which were also somewhat featured in Shattered Soldier, but with Neo Contra, the song we're gonna play is called Helic, Helicarrier? Helicarrier. Hel Helicarrier. It's a helicopter and a and carrier. carrier. It's a helicarrier. helicarrier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this track is pretty much right out of Dance Dance Revolution, which Soda Fujimori worked on a lot of Dance Dance Revolu Revolution tracks, so you'll be able to kind of hear the influence and uh, hear... Actually, there's a really interesting story about Contra and DDR as far as how they got mixed in. There's a mix of a, of a song, which I'll post on our Facebook page. It's uh, a mix of this song called Midnight Blaze, and they take a song that we played actually in the past on a previous episode of, I believe it was the episode six, the uh, Beyond Chip 2. Beyond Chip 2. Yeah, that song, they mixed it in with this uh, Midnight Blaze track, and so you get the lyrics from Midnight Blaze, but you get the music from Shattered Soldier. Hmm. And it's like, and they actually, it's the Battle Train track, and they do that in Neo Contra as well, but without lyrics or vocals. So when you guys you should really check out our Facebook page so you can see when we post this because it's really cool, really cool stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it more on Facebook. So get to signing up on Facebook, guys. Come on now. Totally. Also, since you were talking about mixing music and stuff, yeah. the theme song from Neo Contra with that very chuggy guitar line, mm -hmm. that was directly taken from a band called Chem Lab. Oh, really? On their album called Eastside Militia, which was actually one of my favorite bands before this game came out, and I'm listening to this, the, the video intro, and I'm like, I know this song. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> I don't know if there was any credit given to the actual band or not, but the way they mix the music together is, is really, really cool. I did not so, know that. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, so check that out if you ever see it. I'm sure it's on YouTube. We can post a link to it, too. I'll do a little comparison. Man, you guys are getting treats. It's crazy. Facebook treats. Facebook treats. They're like in the shape of like little Facebook. Little thumbs up. Things. Yeah, little thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like little dog bone treats. All right, so what's this one called again? <laughs> this one's called Helicarrier from Neo Contra for the PS2. Get your dancing shoes on, boys and girls.
Opening this summer, inspired by events on Days of Our 30 Lives, it's Epic Contra Center! Did you just say Epcot Center? <laughs> That's already been done already. No, you idiot. This ain't your kid's Disney theme park. Featuring some of the most terrifying, death-defying rides this side of a random South American island, Epic Contra Center will keep you coming back for more. Hmm, okay, tell me more. Do bumper cars outfitted with spikes and flamethrowers turn you on? Uh, yeah. Does the concept of leaping from roller coaster car to roller coaster car as each one plummets into an endless chasm get your heart pumping? Hell yeah! How does a machine gun with mysteriously unlimited amounts of ammo sound? Oh my god, I, I don't even... Does the ability to be genetically modified into a leaping lizard or sunglass-wearing wolfman with chain guns for hands whet your appetite? Eh, not so much. Well, okay. That's understandable. But, but still, Epic Contra Center is located on an island formerly occupied by Red Falcon, so international safety rules don't apply. The danger is real. The thrills are real. The possibility of you crapping your pants is definitely real. Wow, amazing! How do I buy tickets? Simply sign over your estate to Red Falcon. I mean Contra Entertainment Industries, and we'll send a helicopter your way. Just grab on and enjoy the ride. Epic Contra Center, the last summer destination you'll ever need. All right, Ed, welcome us back. I always welcome us back. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> that was a little too Mr. Rogers. Was it? Yeah. All right. Hey, guys, welcome back. <laughs> that was from Contra 4. That is the waterfall track that was originally composed by the Contra NES composer. We already talked about Hidenori Maizawa and Kiyohiro Sada. So that was their original composers. This version was composed by Jake Kaufman. I gotta say, he blew it out of the water for me, but that's Jake Kaufman. I think the developers brought this game way forward in the industry. <laughs> definitely, yeah. They, <laughs> they, they definitely went way forward and advanced things. <laughs> uh, so obviously the game was developed by Way Forward Technologies. This is one of the rare exceptions where outsourcing a game to the right company is the right way to go about honoring the game because this was the 20th anniversary release of a Contra game and so they wanted to do it in style. The game is fantastic, really well done, one of the best Contras that they released probably since, I don't know, probably since Shattered Soldier. I mean, Neo yeah. Contra was good too. But it wasn't, wrong. because it was only like top down, yeah. it didn't feel like a real Contra. A lot of people say that, it still has the feel of it. Um, the biggest thing that I, I remember reading uh, in the interview on the Contra 4 game, there's like, you can unlock interviews and like all sorts of stuff. The interview that they made with one of the directors Basically, basically the, like the the series guy who leads it, kind of like um, Iga, yeah, uh, like Koji Igarashi for Castlevania. But in this case, I, I don't can't remember his name. But he talks a little bit about um, Contra and and Contra Four and the development of the series. I think the fact that Konami gave it a numerical title, saying this is Contra Four, when there hasn't been a numerical Contra since. The Super Nintendo game means that Konami knew they had a really good title and a hit on their hands, and they were like, "We're going to bless this with like, <laughs> like the like the continuation of the canonical story that that, yeah. that Contra follows." Yeah, they wanted to make it so that we're going to release a game that is going to be not only a throwback but also a celebration of the series, which yeah. is really cool. So Contra 4 kind of takes advantage of the dual screen, hence Contra 4. Yeah, wasn't it called Dual Spirits in Japan? I believe so, yeah. The word spirits, actually, in terms of Contra, has kind of been prevalent in almost all the games. Uh, originally, uh, Contra 3 was called, uh, I believe it was Contra Spirits. Uh, and then they were going to originally make a Contra game for the N64 that got canceled. or got, it, was, it was scheduled to be... Created, and that was called, I think, Contra Spirit 64. Mm. Um, so, God, can you imagine what a Contra N64 game would have been like? I, I, honestly, I think about it and I get goosebumps because I feel like Konami would have ha held it in house and they would have blown it out the water. Oh, again. see, I had the opposite opinion. Oh, really? I thought it would have been. Just looking at what they did around that era with yeah. the 
PlayStation and Saturn games. Castlevania too. Like yeah, I, I just thought that, and I was never a big fan of the N sixty four's technological. Like, I don't know. For Contra, you need I think really detailed, crisp graphics, and the N sixty four just couldn't. Yeah. It could push polygons, but yeah. they were big, blocky polygons with a lot of fog, and I just don't think it had the graphical. It wasn't a powerhouse right. in order to you know really get across those huge bosses and stuff. But that's just me. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I mean, I don't know. The N sixty four had its moments in the right hands, and th- and that seems to be the pattern of Nintendo systems. Yeah, is in if you put this, I would say Super Nintendo excluded, like Nintendo Super Nintendo. Basically, anybody who tried <laughs> basically could do really well on those systems. But with the N sixty four, I would say. Nintendo knew what they were doing. Like, they knew their stuff. And they knew how to make ginormous bosses. Like, if you play Ocarina of Time... Sure. I mean, you're playing huge, ginormous bosses that could, in theory, work. But all they had to do... I mean, if you look at, like, Mischief Makers, which was, you know, a treasure game, so ex-Konami employees, they knew what they were doing, and they didn't make it blocky or ugly. They could have easily done a 2D... Like or two and a half D contra game with sprites that were like also polygons um, and and just make it all they had to do was just avoid the fog the you know the Superman sixty four yeah. fog style yeah. of gameplay and I think they could have I think they could have made something yeah. work I guess I Konami just didn't really have that great of a track record with the N sixty four so I think they probably weren't even going to try to attempt it yeah plus you know Nintendo was on their huge anti violence kick at that point too that is so. true. You know, perhaps they just wanted to avoid that whole thing and go after the PlayStation market. Which is funny because, I mean, Smash Brothers bra- or Super Smash Brothers for the N64 was nothing but violence. Conquerors, Bad Fur Day was actually more uncensored. I think that was the exception to the rule. Yeah. I, mean, I think that was a grand experiment by Nintendo to figure out whether people would actually buy that stuff. Yeah. I mean, Conquerors, uh, Bad Fur Day on the 64 was actually less censored than... The Xbox version, which you're thinking, Xbox, oh, you know, 18 plus, you know, but yeah. I don't know, just doesn't work out that way. But anyways, getting way off track here, Contra <laughs> 4 utilized the two screens on the DS. So the bottom screen was your main screen that you would play through, and there were, they give you like this, I don't know, Bionic Commando type item where you can shoot up and jump up, and it was really innovative because you could go very much like Super Contra, like what we were talking about before. You can go to a higher level, you can go on a lower level. But the screen is so big that you can kind of... You have that freedom to move yeah, around and still yeah. see where things are. And it went yeah. back to the old original Contra game, which was on a vertical screen. So yeah. it gave you that perspective back. That's the thing, though, with the Contra games, or really just any game that I think these early Japanese developers have created. When you look and see what they've done with the series with way forward did it was the right direction to go in uh, to have this split split screen adventure and even though it was on a handheld it still played like a, a re- regular console game whereas if you play other games they're more like oh well this is you know the portable version of it and it was a lot worse or it wasn't as good or you would rather just play it on the console. Yeah. This is right around the time when people started playing handhelds because the the actual experience that we're going to be going with is going to be a lot more enjoyable and is is comparable to, like, for example, most of the 3DS games that are coming out now are games that we would have played 10 to 15, 20 years ago, and it feels right. It feels like I can sit down and play this on this huge, ginormous 3DS XL screen and have a ton of fun. Yeah. Plus, at this point around where the DS was... Retro started coming back in style again. True. So these throwbacks, especially, you know, stuff put out by, by WayForward, they knew that, that throwbacks to the original stuff would be more appreciated by their audiences, and they were able Definitely. to put more money behind it and make it a more quality title. Which kind of brings us to Contra Rebirth, our next yeah. title. Uh, so this was a WiiWare game, and I don't know, I usually shrug WiiWare off because... I've played a lot of WiiWare games, and the majority of them were just utter crap. A lot of them are really terrible, but Konami actually... And I really wish Konami would still make games for Nintendo uh, consoles and handhelds, because they really haven't put out much lately, which we'll get into before we close out. But with Contra Rebirth for WiiWare, they took three series. So they took Gradius, uh, Contra, and Castlevania, and they made basically these throwback titles that were all original, all brand new. Rebirths. 
but they were rebirths. <laughs> they were recreations of that that feeling that you would get cracking open Contra 3 for the very first time and playing. So with Contra Rebirth, this track that we're going to be listening to is from Area 3, which is the third level. The composer for this, uh, this song was originally on Operation C, the Game Boy game, Stage 2. So the composer of this track, or at least not the original, but the remake, was Manabu Namiki. Yeah, and he did all three of the Rebirth games. So he, Fantastic Yeah, he rearranged the soundtracks for the Contra, Gradius, and... Um, Castlevania, so yeah. he, and he did a fantastic job with all of them. all three, yeah. And he actually, this was uh, one of the few recent games that have come out actually on a soundtrack, like physically released on a soundtrack uh, in Japan that you can go to the store and buy. And uh, I don't think Gradius was on there, but Castlevania and Contra were definitely both on yep. that CD, they were. and they were both really phenomenal. So this track is fantastic, really high energy, uh, awesome driving guitars. Just really good stuff. Yeah, and the game was fantastic too. There were unlockables. There were, it really paid homage to like the the extreme absurdity that Contra had started. It almost started parroting itself, like you were saying with Shattered Soldier. Yeah. Um, the stage they had, running on camels' backs. And yeah, running like on camels, robot camels. Well, they were llamas, I think. Or llamas? Yeah, yeah, they were llamas. They were huge llamas, llamas and yeah. you can shoot yeah, their llamas. heads. And... <laughs> <laughs> half camel, half llama. Hey, they, they all kind of look like that. Yeah, but. Yeah. And then, you know, like, Lance Bean, I think, ended up being, like, he was working undercover behind enemy lines as a woman. What? <laughs> That's so So he weird. had a huge feather boa and, yeah. like, a wig, and he would rescue you at the end of the game with a, his boa was flying <laughs> out of the helicopter. It was just absolutely wow. absurd. And it's a really, really fun game to play. So if you don't pay too much attention to WiiWare and you have a Wii, spend the, or even the 10 Wii U. bucks or whatever and definitely, and definitely grab this one because it's a lot of fun. It's really good. So we're going to go ahead and listen to this track. Area 3, Contra Rebirth, originally from Operation C. Check this track out.
And we are back. That was Hardcore Uprising. Hard Corpse Uprising. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> I, I really dig this track. I love the piano behind the drums at the beginning. Yeah. It's yeah. really good stuff. This uh, this game was a brainchild of Daisuke Ishiwatari. He did mainly the Guilty Gear games for Arc System Works. And that this game also was developed by Arc System Works. Right, right there again, outsourcing. But you know what? It works. I mean, I wasn't a fan of this game. I remember playing the demo and was like, not interested. You know what I think the biggest problem that I have is with this game is they pulled... A modern day DLC with it. So, mm. for example, you look at Contra 4, you look at Contra Rebirth. Now, these are whole games that got released that had a bunch of really cool unlockables, especially Contra 4. I mean, you play through that game, they had challenge mode where you can unlock new characters, new costumes, and really, like, that's what drove me to beating the game over and over and over again and playing these, like, incredibly difficult challenges that really were really unique and fun and different for the series. And then you go to Contra Rebirth and same thing, like you're playing this game over and over to unlock new characters and stuff. With Hardcore's Up Uprising, you had to pay for new characters. And I'm just like, modern, modern video game developers. Yeah, I guess. But the when game I was your age, <laughs> everything came in the box. The game was decently long. I mean, there was a lot of content for what you originally okay. purchased. And the characters had new moves, like like dashes and, and little hops that you can get over smaller obstacles. And the way the game was built is that it would, you know, kind of similar to like how Shattered Soldier did, it would rank you based on your performance, about how long it took you to get through, how many enemies you beat, etc., cool. etc. Et so it was really designed for more the hardcore players as well. And, and and while there was some DLC in the form of extra characters, you got a good 90% of the content, I think, with the initial purchase. And it wasn't a full-price game yeah, either. Yeah, true, so, true. I just, I feel like they should have... I also am really bothered by the fact that they were like, oh, it's not really Contra, but it is Contra. And it was supposed to be like a a, a, a new version of... Like a rebirth of the series, but they just came out with rebirth. Yeah. So it's kind of like retreading on old information. Well, it's a prequel. Right. It takes place like twenty or sixty years before the original Contra. Does. Right. Which also takes pri place prior to Contra Hardcore. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, this features um, Bahamut, who was the main bad guy in Hardcore for the Genesis. So. <laughs> The storylines are intertwined. I mean, even though yeah. it doesn't say Contra in the title, it's definitely part of the Contra universe. And there really isn't any doubt, if you do a little bit of research, that it's that it's actually a Contra game. Yeah. I, I don't know why they didn't decide to use the the name in the title. Yeah, that kind of bugs me. You know. I don't know why. I don't know either. So but, what came out after Hard Corpse? Um, Corpse. Corpse. Hard Corpse. <laughs> <laughs> um... We're gonna duke this out one day, right? And we're gonna like I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you hypnotize is what I'm gonna do, and that way every time <laughs> you see the word, you're gonna think cores, and forevermore I will win. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so there really hasn't been any traditional contra games since Hardcore Uprising. It came out what 2011? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's only been you know a couple of years, but I haven't even really heard of anything in the works yet. So this this Chinese company called Coco China. Created, Sounds delicious. Yeah, created this game called Contra Evolution, which is essentially the original Contra game, but completely redone with HD graphics, etc., etc. It came out as an arcade game in, I think, China only, mm -hmm. but then they released it for iOS and Android in the U.S., and while it's a cool game, it's free to play. Oh, boy. So you know what that means. You have to pay for extra lives to get Are you serious? The game. Wow. It's absurd. You know what, though? If you really think about it, it's pretty much the arcade experience. Because you figure, in, you get three lives, let's just say. So they give you three lives to blow through the game, right? Okay, so now I gotta pay for more lives with, a, with a, you know, the quarters. Or yeah. Whatever. So it's, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, the thing that kind of bugs me about something like that is it takes away, it makes it less about the experience and more about stopping what you're doing and 
everything that you would normally do in an arcade environment is a lot quicker. Mom, I need more quarters. Yeah. Boom. You've got them, you put them in the machine. With something like this, you know, now you've got to get a credit card, or now you've got to, you know, tap the button to, to buy more. So yeah, it could be more instant if you really think about it, but at the same time, like, nobody wants that. You know, like... Arcade games were cool, and this, yeah. is, this, is, this is my opinion on the situation, is that arcade games were cool, and you wanted to put money into them because they were better than what you had at home. And it was an experience you were willing to throw quarters into because you had, I don't know, Street Fighter II cabinet, but you didn't have it at home, or if you did, it was an inferior version on the Super Nintendo. With this, it's like, okay, there are better games than this, Elsewhere, and you're playing this on a handheld, not on a console. Yeah. And you're expected to pay more money into it every single time you want. It's not an arcade cabinet. It doesn't have that kind of feeling to it. I would rather give the company three or five bucks and have the full game and spend time with it and get better with it than, you know, oh, you only get three guys. You got to pay if you want to have, like, four guys or pay if you want to have five guys every time you want to start the game. It, yeah, it I just agree with doesn't you. I agree with you there. Like, it, it's. It doesn't give you the opportunity to get better at the game. It just is more focused on grabbing your money. Right. Whereas with the original Contra and the arcades, you could go a certain distance and get better and better and then have to put in quarters and then get better and better and advance more and more. But with this, it's more of a... I, it seems like they care more about your money than... Which I know, it's That's a business. That's free to play, man. Hey, I know it's a business. I know they're trying to make cash. I get that. But it's all about what the value is for that cash. Yeah. And I've said in the past, I, I play a lot of mobile games. I love my iPad to death. I play so many games on it. But I just, I, I can't swallow this free-to-play model. No. I'm just very, very against it. I would much rather pay up front. Give me a free demo, give me a little bit of it, and say, okay, you can unlock all of this content for two, three, five bucks, whatever. As long as I as long as I feel the value is there for the initial purchase, I'll buy it. But if I'm buying a consumable item where I get I buy like fifteen gems and then once I buy a power up, those gems are gone, I don't I don't see the use in that. Well, it's basically uh, free to play. It's more like pay to win. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, you're going to be able to play the game for free, but are you really going to enjoy the game for free? No. No. You're going to have to dump all this money in, uh, which is fine, but give me the full thing. Give me the full package. I, I don't want to pay for DLC. I don't want to... DLC has lost its point as far as what the point of it is. And I know we're getting really off track, but this is important that we should address it because if you're gonna go with a game that's based on an arcade experience like Contra, you gotta leave it with that experience. You can't transform that experience into something that's gonna be negative and devalue the yeah, product. You can't make it impossible unless you pay more. Correct, right. If you're gonna make a game that is brutally difficult, you cannot make it so that all I'm doing is paying more than playing. Because that's what it's going to turn into, unfortunately, and that's where the series is going to be headed to. And I, I honestly think that that's part of the reason why they haven't made any Contra games, because they don't know how to make money off of it. And that's why a lot of these game companies, like for example Capcom with Mega Man, haven't put out these games because they're like, how can we make bank on these old school retro titles? Other than coming out with merchandise for them, what are we going to do? Yeah, And I would love to see a 3D Contra sure. game on the 3DS. They were I mean, the they base were developing levels would be phenomenal. They were developing it. When the 3DS first got announced, one of the first games that got announced, that you, I don't know if you remember that. I don't remember. They introduced the C logo. So the C logo comes up on screen on fire and it says... Uh, I do remember it that. It says now. C okay. and it's like 3DS or something like that. Yep. And everyone was pumped. I mean, I was waiting. I'm still waiting for this game. And Maybe it's going to be so awesome that it's going to be worth right. a three-year wait. <laughs> These franchises need to advance, and I think the whole point of everything that we've been talking about today is you've seen progress from Contra to Contra game. You know, you've seen advancement, you've seen change, you've seen evolution in gameplay. And I think once Contra 4 came out, that was kind of their breaking point. Contra Rebirth was more like the same but better for old school stuff, yeah. but there was no advancement. Hard Corps tried something you know, new where they can like kind of reboot the series, and it didn't work. And so I think that what a lot of these Japanese developers are gonna be realizing is we either need to do full-on retro games that are total throwbacks, that play like total throwbacks, and don't advance the series anymore, 
or we have to completely overhaul the series and even if the fans go kicking and screaming into the night, we need to make some changes because we're going to die if we don't. Like Castlevania. Yeah. yeah. And they did that <laughs> and it didn't work because you, the game didn't play like Castlevania. But you know what? That's for October. We'll get into Castlevania at some point. <laughs> but for right now, Contra, what an amazing series though. Yes. Pretty uh, good track record for the most part. Full of huge, huge games, huge, huge soundtracks, lots of excellent positive memories from this series. Definitely. Uh, just just do with this podcast. Maybe you want to go home and play more Contra. Right? Seriously, we need to co-op some Contra. Absolutely. Yeah. So again, thanks for listening. You can check us out on Facebook.com forward slash Pixeltunes Radio. Twitter.com. Our handle is Pixel Tunes Radio. Pixel Tunes Radio. And also Instagram. Instagram, Pixel Tunes Radio on there as well. Yeah, that's our handle on there. We post little pictures and all sorts of doodads, but And the only oddity is YouTube. Yeah. You can't find us at Pixel Tunes Radio on YouTube. <laughs> you can, he's lying. <laughs> go to youtube.com forward slash dongled, or honestly just go to YouTube and type in Pixel Tunes Radio. Pixel Tunes is one word. Radio is the second. Absolutely. So we've got a great show. We've done a great show. <laughs> we've got what a great show. What am I talking show? about? <laughs> We're just going to roll right into the next show. <laughs> so thanks, guys, for hanging out with us for this hour and a half. We'll be back in two weeks. Two weeks. With a new Pixel Tunes radio. Peace out, suckers. Pow.